think about Mozart, Beethoven, and Schubert, and the wide-ranging musical worlds they created, it's easy to overlook the fact that they lived very close to each other in space and time. If Mozart hadn't died young, he would have been just 72 years old when Beethoven died at the age of 56 and when Schubert died at 31. They all lived in Vienna, sometimes just blocks apart, and walked the same streets of the inner city. They knew and worked with many of the same musicians in the same venues. During this relatively brief period, we move away from music dominated by kings, the aristocracy, and the church. The Enlightenment, the French Revolution, and the beginnings of industrialism created a new social order, one where we can begin to recognize ourselves. In Schubert, we finally meet the kind of musician we know today, a little like a singer-songwriter, living in a middle-class world, writing music for his friends, and hoping to make it without having to take a day job. Schubert also had a secret life composing larger works, but almost no one knew about it, and very little of the music was performed in his lifetime. In 1797, when Schubert was born, Beethoven, in his late twenties, was conquering the Viennese aristocracy with his brilliant pianistic virtuosity. Just a few miles away, Schubert's father was working long hours as a schoolteacher, trying to support his family. Neither of Schubert's parents were native Austrians. They were German-speaking immigrants from rural Poland and Moravia, whose parents had moved to Vienna, hoping for a better life. Schubert's mother gave birth 14 times to produce the five children who survived infancy. Franz Peter Schubert was born in the house on the left. He had three older brothers and one younger sister. On the right is the building where he spent his early childhood. The whole family lived together in two rooms of this schoolhouse where his father was teaching. All of the Schubert boys were expected to become school teachers. The father was pious, strict, and a very religious Catholic. The happiest times were the hours making music, in the evenings and on holidays. Franz learned violin from his father and piano from his oldest brother. He was the youngest member of the family string quartet and played viola. He also sang in the local church choir and participated in performances of music by Mozart and Haydn. When he was 10 years old, his exceptionally fine singing voice was heard by Salieri, the same Salieri you've heard about in connection with both Mozart and Beethoven. For more than 40 years, the powerful Italian Salieri was the Habsburg Emperor's Kapellmeister and opera director. Salieri invited young Schubert to join the choir of the Imperial Court Chapel. Franz was also given a scholarship to the prestigious Latin School Seminary. He left his home and family at the age of 11 to be educated with boys from a much higher social class. For the next five years, young Franz's life was packed with church and chamber performances. He liked wearing the school uniform because it obscured the differences in family background between the boys. In his new environment, Schubert at first was shy and withdrawn, a short pudgy boy in spectacles. He played violin and viola in a small school orchestra that read through a different symphony every evening. Before long, he was conducting the ensemble in spite of his youth. Gradually, his musical accomplishments won him friends. The first of these was Josef von Spaun. Spaun was seven years older than Schubert, but he was impressed with his young friend's intellect and his passion for music. Occasionally, Spaun, who was well off, took Schubert to the opera. In the coming years, a group of boys formed around Schubert and Spahn, sharing a commitment to art, literature, and to each other. Just keeping track of their names can be a formidable task. Here they are as adults. Spahn, Schober, Schwind, Kuppelweiser, Kenner, Holzapfel, Huttenbrenner, Bauernfeld, and Sonnleitner. They all played a part in Schubert's development. This was the beginning of the Schubert circle that would love and nurture him throughout his life.
Without their letters and reminiscences, we'd know almost nothing about Schubert personally, because the composer wrote few letters and only rarely kept a diary. Schubert was granted the special honor of private composition lessons with Salieri, who also thrilled him with occasional expeditions to the Graben for ice cream. Schubert's first extant composition dates from 1810 when he was 13. It's D1 in the catalog of Schubert's complete works that was published by Otto Deutsch in 1951. The piece is a 23-minute fantasy to be played as a piano duet, also called Piano Four Hands, which was a popular pastime in Viennese households. As the fantasy opens, hunting horns create a cheerful pastoral setting, but unexpectedly a dark and turbulent energy changes everything. Salieri hoped to make an opera composer out of Schubert and provided his student with stock Italian lyrics to set to music. He was annoyed when he learned that Schubert had become captivated by ballads in the barbarous German language. Schubert was spending all his spare time imitating them. At the age of 14, Schubert began composing what we now call Lieder, and refining the craft that would bring him fame in his lifetime and transform the lead into a major art form. Inevitably, Schubert's years as a boy soprano came to an end. Schubert himself humorously noted on the score of a mass that it was in this piece that Franz Schubert crowed for the last time on July 26, 1812. Although he was offered a scholarship to continue his academic studies at the seminary, he declined. He was talking about devoting his life to art. Franz moved back to his family home where his mother had died and his father was now remarried. Schubert's father was alarmed by Franz's plans and insisted that his son attend a teacher training school. Since the family no longer lived in the inner city, Franz had a long walk into town every day for teacher training, for his ongoing lessons with Salieri, and for the continuation of his social life at the seminary. Despite the crowded conditions at home, the 16-year-old Schubert was incredibly productive, dazzling his circle of friends with songs, dances, and string quartets. Listen to how the intimate and lovely opening of his third quartet succumbs to a threatening and forceful new theme. <laughs> 
Franz's family had a close relationship with their neighbors, the Grobes, who were also a music-loving family. The Grobe household had two major attractions, a piano, which was available to Schubert whenever he wished, and a 15-year-old daughter, Therese, who had a beautiful soprano voice. Schubert wrote many songs for Therese, and the highlight of their collaboration was her performance of the soprano solos in his Mass in F major. This Mass was written for the 100th anniversary of his local church. At the age of 17, Schubert himself conducted the chorus, orchestra, and soloists. Salieri attended, and Schubert's father was so impressed that he bought his son a piano of his own. This is an excerpt from the Kyrie, revealing what must have been Therese's remarkable singing ability and Schubert's impressive skills. Here's a later picture of Therese Grobe as a mature woman, after she'd married a successful baker. With Therese, Schubert experienced his first opportunity for romance. Biographers, until very recently, believed that for Schubert, this was the first rejection in what would be a lifetime of romantic heartbreak. It was episode one in the historic portrayal of Schubert as meek, timid, and childlike but current scholarship points in another direction. As appreciative as Franz was of Therese's artistry, he was beginning to realize that the role of husband and father was the last thing he wanted. Perhaps he already knew he was gay and had already experienced same-sex relationships at the seminary. Perhaps he was still inexperienced or hoping that he would change, but abundant evidence points to his growing certainty that he was different. He was a misfit and an outsider. There were frightening interactions with his father, who expected him to marry and support a family. These scenes were surely one source of the shadows and anguish already present in his music. We should also have a look at the social and political realities evolving in Vienna at this time. The revolutionary liberal era of Napoleon ended with the Congress of Vienna, and now there was a reactionary climate of political repression. The mean-spirited emperor, Franz Joseph, and his minister, Metternich, were in charge. Their paranoia and resistance to any form of self-expression were leading to increased censorship and even spying. You needed permission from the government to do almost anything. The young adolescents that Schubert associated with were almost all destined for bureaucratic careers, either in the government or in business. They were educated, but they weren't aristocrats. They were going to have to support themselves, and strict conformity was required within the social hierarchy. Schubert's friends knew that they had to conceal their individuality, their idealism, and perhaps their discussions about masculine roles. Although the state disapproved, young men were meeting in clubs and secret societies throughout Vienna. The reading of German language literature was a priority. This connected the young men to the broader currents of romanticism that had been emerging in Germany for several decades. Beethoven was still holding on to Schiller's poem, Ode to Joy. It would be 12 more years before he finally incorporated it into his Ninth Symphony. <laughs> 
Goethe's coming-of-age novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther, was read by everyone in Schubert's circle. Schubert was particularly focused on poetry because it provided the source and the inspiration for his leader. In the year following his mass with Therese, he enthralled his friends when he sang his settings of two poems by Goethe. These two songs were the early masterpieces Gretchen at the Spinning Wheel and The Earl King. Schubert used the piano to create the sounds of a spinning wheel and a horse's galloping hooves. The musical setting delivered unprecedented drama and psychological insight. Schubert would write 650 liter over the course of his life. Since each one is dated, they provide us with something like a diary, revealing Schubert's evolving sense of himself. Schubert's choice of a particular poetic text and the way he chose to set it tells us a lot about what was on his mind. This early song, also from Goethe, is Haydn Roseline, The Heath Rose. The psychological ambiguity of its text gave Schubert an opportunity to question the virile ideal of a manhood. The cheerful, strophic music creates an ironic setting for what's actually a sad tale about a boy's naive bravado and a girl's failed struggle to protect herself. We can sense Schubert's amusement, but also his sympathy for young men and women confined by their social roles. War so jung und morgen schön, lief er schnell es nah zu sehen, saß mit vielen Freuden. Röslein, 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 ruht, Röslein auf der Heide. Sprach, ich breche dich, Röslein auf der Heide. Röslein sprach, ich steche dich, dass du ewig denkst an mich und ich will's nicht leiden. Röslein, 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 ruht, Röslein auf der Heide. Der wilde Knabe brach's Röslein auf der Heiden. Röslein wirrte sich und stach, half ihm doch kein Weh und Ach, musst es eben leiden. Röslein, Röslein, Röslein. During Schubert's 18th and 19th years, he had to work full-time at his father's school, teaching the youngest students, who demanded the most patience. He had frequent rows with his father, who was becoming more and more worried about his son's social respectability. Schubert was writing an enormous amount of music, but he was also spending as many evenings as possible in town, regaling his friends with his latest compositions. His songs and dances encouraged emotional intimacy and induced an almost trance-like state of inner longing. There was abundant wine, and whenever Schubert was present, music was the focus of the gathering. But there was also talk about literature, current events, and the responsible futures that awaited everyone once they became working adults. Schubert was keeping a diary at this time. He wrote, To a free man... Matrimony is a terrifying thought. He exchanges his freedom for melancholy and crude sensuality. He also wrote, Take people as they are, not as they should be. It's a bad stage director who gives his actors parts they're unable to play. This next song, with words by Goethe, describes a disillusioned and world-weary view of love, an attitude unusual for someone as young as Schubert. <laughs> 
But this song was very popular in Schubert's circle, as if everyone knew that the freedom they brought to their first love would be lost again when they aged and loved again. Notice how this short song drifts from minor to major, the singer's last words cadence in major, as if there might still be hope, but the piano's final phrase revokes all possibility of optimism. It was at this time that Schubert met Franz von Schober, who would become his closest friend and the love of his life. Schober was from a wealthy family and lived in the inner city with his mother and sister. His father had died, and Schober was in charge of the family money, which he spent lavishly. He was charismatic and cast a spell over all the young men. He would hold forth on aesthetics and philosophy in his room at his mother's house a room carpeted and upholstered in the Persian style, where he affected the manner of an oriental prince. Schober recognized Schubert's genius, and the two young men began an intense relationship that would last throughout Schubert's life. There could be no exclusivity in this relationship, because Schober was adored by everyone and the object of possessiveness and jealousy. This doesn't seem to have troubled Schubert, who valued the vibrant intellectual and artistic atmosphere that Schober always made possible. Encouraged by Schober, Schubert began to challenge his relationships with authority figures. He abruptly terminated his lessons with Salieri, and he quit his job at his father's school. He moved back to the inner city, living first with Spaun and then with Schober. While he might have experienced some exhilaration by refusing to conform, he was confronted by a threatening emptiness. He had no money. His friends were buying his music paper and had to feed and house him. Despite his talent, he wasn't positioned for a career. He couldn't relate to the traditional male roles and had no desire for a family. If he was gay, his prospects for sexual gratification were made hazardous by laws against homosexuality. The future was unimaginable, and daily life in dirty, crowded Vienna was grim. The song you're about to hear, written at this time, became one of the most performed songs during Schubert's lifetime. The poet, Schmidt von Lubeck, had articulated the feelings of urban, educated Viennese who had a growing sense that modernity would be accompanied by alienation. The fulfillment possible in the past no longer seemed attainable. In the middle of this song, listen for the music Schubert chose to represent an idealized, lost homeland. 
It evokes the rural folk atmosphere of the Austrian mountains. Schubert's friends knew that Schubert's musical settings vastly increased the power of the poetry. They were sure that his work would be published and bring him fame and financial security. But it would be a few more years before even one song was published. Spahn was certain that Goethe, the greatest living German poet, would champion Schubert's music if he could just hear it. He assembled a volume of Schubert's songs, neatly copied by Schubert, and including the three impressive songs with words by Goethe, Gretchen, The Earl King, and Haydn Roslein. This volume was sent to Goethe with a long letter from Spaun praising Schubert's work. The package was returned to Spaun with no comment. Schubert did get a break when Schober introduced him to the baritone Michael Vogel, who'd been a well-known operatic soloist in Vienna for over 20 years. Schubert was elated when Vogel became a champion of his songs. At last, there was a skilled interpreter, someone beside himself, who could sing his songs. This is a picture that Schober drew of Vogel and Schubert walking down a street in Vienna. Vogel was almost 30 years older than Schubert, and he was a tall, imposing character. Schubert was just five feet tall and somewhat plump. His friends nicknamed him Schwamerl, which means little mushroom. The friendship between Vogel and Schubert was sealed at their first meeting when Vogel sang Ganymede, a song Schubert had just completed. In order to understand Goethe's poem Ganymede, we must understand that most educated Europeans were well acquainted with mythological characters and the ancient Greek and Roman world. Goethe and other European authors often referred to these classical sources. The mythological figures could symbolize aspects of human behavior. When Zeus fell in love with Ganymede, the most beautiful and virile youth on earth, Zeus turned himself into an eagle in order to carry Ganymede off to Olympus. The story of Zeus and Ganymede confirms what's evident from many sources, that in ancient Greece, older men had erotic relationships with younger men or boys. <laughs> 
Goethe himself defended the practice, saying it was as old as humanity and should be considered natural. Plato differentiated between a higher and a lower eros, and the lower eros was heterosexual. Socrates advised older men about how to gain the favor of adolescents. Within Schubert's cultural milieu, Greek love was a code name for this type of relationship and male homosexual love in general. Goethe's poem, Ganymede, and Schubert's song are clearly about Ganymede's erotic rapture with Zeus and his attainment of a higher sphere of spiritual and sensuous love. There's no doubt that Zeus is the all-loving father in whose lap Ganymede surrenders himself. Schubert's creative setting of Ganymede delighted Vogel, and it became a mainstay in his repertoire. It's a rare example of Schubert affirming a positive outcome for love between men. Now that he was living with Schober, Schubert had access to a piano in the inner city. He wrote his first piano sonatas, as well as his sixth symphony. He landed a lucrative summer job tutoring the two daughters of Count Esterhazy at their country estate in Hungary. He wrote letters back to his friends, collectively addressing them as, My dearest and best friends, you're everything to me. But when he returned from Hungary, he moved in with the poet Johann Meyerhofer. It's not known what had happened between Schubert and Schober, but for the next two years, they were estranged. Meyerhofer had been part of Schubert's circle for five years. He was ten years older, sophisticated, well-educated, and disciplined. While Schubert was writing Ganymede, he also set eight of Meyerhofer's texts on Greek and Roman themes. Meyerhofer was ultimately Schubert's greatest intellectual influence, and they collaborated on 47 Lieder. Personally, Meyerhofer was prone to severe depression throughout his life. He was undoubtedly gay, and he also had to conceal his liberal political views at work because he was a government book censor. Meyerhofer ultimately committed suicide. Another close friend of Schubert was Johann Sen, a poet and activist who'd been part of Schubert's circle since his seminary days. One evening in 1820, 
After a boisterous round of drinking, Sen, Schubert, and a few others were arrested for insulting the police and for harboring suspicious revolutionary ideas. Sen refused to back down. He was imprisoned for 14 months and expelled permanently from Vienna. Schubert was reprimanded, but not sentenced. Schubert was now 23, and his music began to reach a wider audience in Vienna. He was becoming known as a composer of incomparable leader, dances, and choral part songs. After a friendly split-up with Meyerhofer, he got a room of his own, living alone for the first time in his life. He began to take a more active role in publishing his compositions. There were now frequent Schubertians, evenings devoted exclusively to Schubert's music. The singing of Lieder and dancing the night away restored to Schubert's circle the freedom and private pleasure they couldn't experience by day. Some scholars have speculated that Schubert's circle was largely homosexual or bisexual. Although women were included, they rarely played significant roles. Marriage was generally viewed as a cop-out, a cover necessary to gain employment. Viennese musical culture was dominated by Rossini's Italian operas and by Beethoven's instrumental music. Schubert believed that his best chance to advance his career was in the realm of opera. Vogel helped him to make contacts and supported him financially. Schubert's time and energy were now devoted to the writing of operas and singspielen. The Twin Brothers, The Magic Harp, Lazarus, Alfonso and Estrello, and Fiera Bras were all completed, but they only met with minimal success, causing Schubert painful frustration and disappointment. The smaller quantity of instrumental music was excellent, but remained unpublished and virtually unheard in Schubert's lifetime. The Trout Quintet contained a set of variations on Schubert's lead about a lovely silvery trout, an insensitive fisherman, and a dismayed onlooker. It was another text satirizing the customary relationships between men and women. Here's an excerpt from the beloved work. Two other important instrumental works date from this period. One is Schubert's Wanderer Fantasy, a virtuoso piano work based partly on the song you heard earlier. Schubert had devised an innovative form of four linked movements that would be imitated by later Romantic composers like Schumann and Liszt. Schubert also wrote several movements of an incomplete Eighth Symphony, which we now know as The Unfinished. It was tossed in a drawer and forgotten. This pattern of abandoning works before they were completed was a feature of Schubert's increasingly turbulent life. Schubert's close-knit circle of friends was expanding and now included younger men. Among them were two noted visual artists, Moritz von Schwind and Leopold Kuppelweiser. Schwind did this famous drawing of a Schubertiad. You can see the composer sitting at the piano. <laughs> 
On the left is the much larger Vogel singing and turning pages for Schubert. On Schubert's other side is Spaun. Everyone seems entranced, but in the middle of the right side, in the second seated row, you can recognize Schober, who is ignoring the music and trying to distract a young woman. Right above her, you can see Meyerhofer. This picture, by Kupelweiser, recalls a party where a game of charades took place while Schubert was taking a break from playing the piano. You can see him watching as his friends create a living tableau of the fall of man. Schober is recognizable as the snake, emerging from the tree to tempt Adam and Eve. Schober was back in Schubert's life and exercising his mysterious power over the composer. In the pictures you just saw, Schwind and Kuppelweiser both singled out Schober in a disapproving way. In future years, Schober was even more maligned for being a dilettante, or even worse, for being incapable of morality or restraint. But Schubert, in a letter to his friend, wrote, Only you, dear Schober, I shall never forget. For what you've meant to me, no one else can mean. Alas. Schubert's overly restrictive early upbringing seems to have resulted in a compulsive hedonism. It was a strong element in his personality, and it was something that he and Schober shared. In later years, members of the circle often spoke of Schubert and Schober's behavior in language that implied something beyond mere adultery or same-sex relationships. Schober preached a mysticism of sensuality, and perhaps it was he who led Schubert to seek out careless sexual affairs and to justify the risks involved. Syphilis was rampant in Vienna, and sexual desire often led to death. Schubert's imagination had often focused on outsiders and misfits, but now he became increasingly obsessed with grotesque characters and violent encounters. He wasn't alone. Evidently, there was a huge surge of pornography in Vienna at this time. A poem by the Viennese poet Matthias von Collen was a striking illustration of how passion leads to disaster. The poem was based on familiar German folk elements, but the poet had explored darker regions, and Schubert was inspired to create a powerful setting. A beautiful young queen was given a dwarf and became erotically fascinated with him, seeking carnal sensation and unnatural pleasures. The dwarf became emotionally obsessed with the queen. She was his whole life. When she returned to the king, the dwarf took her out to sea in a boat and strangled her with a red silk cord. The soundscape Schubert created for this memorable ballad is filled with incessant movement as the tale rushes to its inevitable conclusion. Schubert also included numerous allusions to the fate motive from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which was familiar to all Viennese. Everyone in this tale pays a terrible price for their erotic excesses, as would Schubert in the coming year. Da tritt der Zwerg zur Königin, mag binden um ihren Hals die Schnur von roter Seide. Und weint, und weint, als wollt er schnell vom Grab erwinden, vom Grab erwinden. Er spricht, du selbst bist schuld an diesem Leiden, Weil um den König du mich hast 
Late in 1822, when Schubert was 25, he began experiencing severe symptoms of ill health, headaches, excruciating pain in his back, and then a rash. His hair began to fall out. He had to move out of Schober's apartment and return to his family home in the suburbs. Soon he was too ill to leave the house. Rumors of Schubert's illness spread among his friends and even reached Beethoven's conversation book, where Beethoven's nephew Karl wrote, They greatly praise Schubert, but it's said that he hides himself. Schubert's doctors confirmed what he feared, that he had contracted syphilis. A few months later, he had to be hospitalized and the therapy was as bad as the illness, a stinging salve of highly poisonous tincture of mercury. Schubert began wearing a wig. The disease would run its capricious course for the rest of his life with periods of agonizing illness followed by periods of remission. What didn't change was the certainty of an early death. His time was now limited. Despite the difficulty of the year 1823, Schubert composed three dozen songs, including his first song cycle, Die Schöne Müllerin, The Miller's Beautiful Daughter. He began sketching it while he was still in the hospital. The idea of a large-scale narrative consisting of 20 songs enabled Schubert to create a complex formal structure with greater psychological depth. Beethoven's six-song cycle, On die Ferne Geliebte, had been written seven years earlier. Schubert now established the song cycle as a new genre. It would be taken up by Schumann, Brahms, and Mahler. More than ever, composing provided Schubert with an escape, and he had much to escape from. His infected body, his social alienation, and Vienna's filth, disease, and bad air. While writing this next lead, which is entitled To Be Sung on the Water, Schubert was able to focus on an image of purity and healing. As a boat glides through the water, the piano accompaniment provides one of Schubert's most fascinating water studies. Each stanza moves from minor to major as the narrator floats and breathes and escapes from time. During the crisis of his illness, 
Schubert's feelings of remorse and bitterness sometimes overwhelmed him. He turned again to his friend Meyerhofer's poetry and found that Meyerhofer's self-critical search for order and self-purification pointed to a different coping strategy. To gain control of emotional turmoil, one can resolutely reject all the sensuous attractions of the world. In this song, Schubert's music dramatically creates an atmosphere of psychological crisis. Fierce attempts are made to banish life's temptations in order to hear the transcendent inner music of an ethereal choir. Schubert would never again enjoy the carefree camaraderie of a large circle of friends. He no longer shared their hopeful future. He maintained contact with his closest friends, but worked obsessively every day, consumed by the determination to bring his musical ideas to completion. In the evening, exhausted, he would seek relief, carousing in the taverns with other pub crawlers. He was physically unkempt, reeked of tobacco, and drank excessively every night, all the while condemning himself for sabotaging what remained of his health. Fortunately, the mercury salve treatments seemed to slow down the disease, and Schubert felt well enough to leave the insufferable heat of Vienna in the summer months. In 1823, he traveled in the Austrian Alps with Vogel, and in 1824, he returned for several months to the Esterhazy Castle in Hungary. Early biographers believed that Schubert was in love with the young countess, Karolina Esterhazy. Schubert did dedicate several important compositions to Karolina, and he enjoyed playing forehand piano with his student, but there was no serious emotional connection. Letters to Vienna revealed his interest in Count Esterhazy's valet. Schubert's illness altered his artistic goals. Since he held no permanent position, rarely taught, 
and had no rich patrons, it was essential that he publish his music. But he was no longer satisfied with writing the dances and virtuoso display pieces that everyone wanted from him. In one of his increasingly frequent displays of arrogance, he declared, I'm a man reaching for the stars, and you blowers and fiddlers demanding solos for yourselves are worms and insects under my feet. Schubert was now focused on expanding the potential of classical instrumental forms. He was writing new piano sonatas, string quartets, and other chamber works. This was not the kind of music that would be popular at the Schubertiads. He had to look for opportunities for public performances at established venues. Fortuitously, the great violinist Ignaz Schuppenzig had just returned to Vienna. Schuppenzig had already forged a significant relationship with Beethoven, and the Schuppenzig Quartet would present the premier performance of each of Beethoven's late quartets. When Schuppenzig met Schubert, he became a friend and supporter, enabling Schubert to have his work played by the top Viennese musicians. Schubert now wrote his A minor and D minor string quartets and the octet for strings and winds. 1824 was the year of Beethoven's monumental final concert, featuring the premiere of the Ninth Symphony and three movements from the Misa Solemnis. Schuppenzig was concertmaster, and Schubert eagerly awaited the program. Beethoven's proclamation of the brotherhood of man and the triumph of beauty must have been a welcome inspiration for Schubert's tormented existence. More than ever, Beethoven and his artistic achievements began to dominate Schubert's thoughts. In the summer of 1825, Schubert made a final trip to the Austrian Alps with Vogel, who paid all the bills and sang Schubert's leader whenever there were performance opportunities. It was a brief and final period of true happiness. Schubert's illness was in remission, and his friends joyfully remarked on the reappearance of swans down on his scalp, and later the return of his thick, curly hair. For a while, he was able to shake off his morbidity and obsession with death. Surrounded by lakes and mountains, he wrote to his brother Ferdinand that he considered it the greatest good to be entrusted to the earth and its indescribable power to create new life. Schubert was at last writing a new symphony. In the Viennese musical world, mastery of symphonic music was the ultimate measure of a composer. But it was a daunting proposition to create a work that could continue the trajectory of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. Schubert had already written seven symphonies, all based on his predecessor's models. But with the two movements of the unfinished and his new Ninth Symphony, Schubert was able to bring his compelling lyricism, his expansiveness, and his bold harmonic techniques to an orchestral setting. His Ninth Symphony was huge. Only Beethoven's Ninth was longer. Schubert spent the rest of 1825 and most of 1826 bringing it to completion. For the last movement, Schubert wrote a closing theme reminiscent of Beethoven's Ode to Joy, not because he couldn't think of a theme of his own, but because he wanted to incorporate that iconic theme's expressive connotations. Schubert often quoted themes from his own leader or from other composers' music to take advantage of their poetic associations. In this excerpt from the opening of the development section, Schubert shows his reverence for Beethoven by distinctly showcasing the source of this theme before putting it back to work to accomplish his own glorious ends. <laughs> 
As you could hear, Schubert was fully capable of creating an orchestral sound world that could stand up to Beethoven's. And he was only 29. If he'd lived longer, he would have taken the symphony even farther in a direction of his own. At the time of his death, he was at work on a 10th symphony. Schubert didn't live to hear his ninth symphony. It was Schumann, 13 years later, who finally brought about the ninth's first performance, conducted by Mendelssohn in Leipzig. Schubert's torrent of inspiration continued, despite his disappointment at failing to have his symphony performed or even published. If his last symphony demonstrated a mastery of the past, his last string quartet explored harmonic procedures that pointed to the future. Schubert had discovered methods of harmonic movement and transposition that expanded exponentially the choices available to a composer. His seeming ability to walk through walls harmonically gave his music that characteristic quality of revelation. Schubert's scores provided models for Liszt, Rimsky-Korsakov, Debussy, and even Ligeti a hundred years later. In this excerpt from the finale of the G major quartet, listen for the extreme restlessness of harmonic movement, the eccentric alternations between major and minor, and the abrupt thrusts into remote harmonic regions. Schubert never heard his last string quartet performed in its entirety, and it wasn't published until 1851, almost 25 years later. The news of Beethoven's death in March 1827 was a terrible blow for Schubert. The passing of his artistic father figure was even more traumatizing considering Schubert's own precarious state of health. In the enormous funeral procession, Schubert was one of the torchbearers flanking Beethoven's coffin. Grill Parzer's funeral oration followed, rhetorically asking the crowd who could possibly stand beside Beethoven. Schubert, alone among the onlookers, knew that it would be himself. He'd just begun work on a new song cycle, Winterreise. Winter's Journey was one of Schubert's greatest works of imagination. The poetry had been written by Wilhelm Müller, the same poet whose verses had inspired Die Schöne Müllerin. Sadly, the two artists never met, and Müller died of a heart attack at the age of 32, just as Schubert was finishing his setting of Winterreise. Müller never had any idea of the exalted musical destiny that awaited his poetry. Winter's journey can be experienced as an allegory of Schubert's life, with its conclusion that lasting love, a sense of belonging, and true communication are all unattainable. Over the course of 24 songs, expressive natural landscapes are the background for a wanderer's regret and renunciation. <laughs> 
In the final song, the main character meets an organ grinder, a survivor of society's indifference to the arts and its hostility to anyone existing outside the norm. In Schubert's last year, one masterpiece followed another. Immediately after Winterreise came the piano trio in E-flat major. Like the Trout Quintet, it was outgoing and a wonderful addition to the engagement party of his friend Spaun. Next came the celebrated C major quintet for string quartet plus an additional cello. The C major quintet epitomizes Schubert's late style. He'd attended the first performance of all of Beethoven's late quartets and heard in them the ultimate validation of composing from inner necessity with one's most personal voice. Beethoven's approach had always been a single-minded drive with struggle leading to inevitable victory. Schubert, over the course of his career, increasingly allowed the forward thrust to be enriched by excursions into mysteriously expressive detours, 
Rather than victory, his goal was completeness and acceptance. One year exactly after Beethoven's death, Schubert, at the age of 31, presented the first public performance of his own works at the prestigious Musikverein in Vienna. The program contained part of his last string quartet, the new piano trio, and numerous leader. It was well received and favorably reviewed, but public interest was quickly diverted when the showman violinist Paganini performed three nights later. Schubert then went on to complete his incomparable last three piano sonatas and the F minor fantasy for piano four hands. In the first months of 1828, Schubert was living with Schober and his family. He continued to meet with his friends to discuss literature. He composed new leader on verses by Heine and traveled briefly to visit the grave of Haydn. But his friends were concerned he was drinking less and becoming increasingly remote. His doctors advised that he spend the hottest summer months at his brother Ferdinand's new house. It was south of the inner city where a swamp had just been drained. The drinking water there was unclean, but Schubert hoped for better air. He would be cared for by his half-sister Josepha and Ferdinand. He left his belongings at Schober's, expecting to return in cooler weather. Schubert's last letter was to Schober, begging for more books by James Fenimore Cooper. He'd just finished reading The Last of the Mohicans, and the stories of Indians and frontier life in America were a welcome diversion. All at once, Schubert became unable to eat or drink. His immune system was ravaged by syphilis and mercury poisoning, and now he contracted an infectious fever. As his condition deteriorated, a group of musicians attempted a bedside performance of Beethoven's C-sharp minor quartet. It was the last music Schubert heard. In his final delirium, unsure of where he was, he cried out, Beethoven doesn't lie here, which Ferdinand understood as his brother's last wish to be buried next to his idol. Two days after Schubert's death, and after a funeral where Schober was the chief mourner, Schubert's body was carried three miles to the cemetery where Beethoven was buried. His coffin was laid in a grave separated from Beethoven's by three others. It was the best that Ferdinand could do. Money for a memorial monument had to be raised by a public concert and donations from friends. But 1828 was hardly the end. Thirty-five years later, Schubert's coffin was dug up and placed in a more robust zinc coffin and then buried again. In 1888, 
both Schubert and Beethoven were moved to a new cemetery outside the city center, where later they'd be joined by Brahms. Schubert's posthumous career was even more unpredictable than his exhumations. Increased interest in his leader led to the publication of the remaining two-thirds of his songs. The chamber music and piano sonatas were the next to be published, causing widespread astonishment and admiration. Nine years later, when Schumann visited Ferdinand in Vienna, they discovered an enormous amount of Schubert's music stored in a large trunk. With the first public performance of The Unfinished in 1865, all the symphonies had finally been performed publicly. Thirty-seven years after his death, Schubert was finally attaining the stature he'd foreseen for himself. His friends wrote reminiscences alluding to his dual nature. They understandably had a desire to protect Schubert and possibly themselves from a narrow-minded public. Until Maynard Solomon's 1989 article, Schubert and the Peacocks of Benvenuto Cellini, there was never a convincing portrait of Schubert's personality or of his intimate relationships. Only now is it possible to understand that Schubert's powerful erotic and hedonistic appetites were among the many qualities that enabled him to compassionately and realistically portray the human condition. Schubert was also the first composer to struggle with modernity, to portray a society which promised individuality but delivered vulnerability and loneliness. Although rural life was idealized, it was abandoned in favor of an irresistible new urban alternative. This last song with words by Schiller was written by Schubert almost 200 years ago, but its lament couldn't be more timely. Schubert's music still seizes us, exposing our sense of loss and our lack of fulfillment as we long for the lost wholeness of a beautiful world. Thank you. 